Well then, let me officially welcome you to September on the standpoint. This is a month of overcoming challenges. On the 5th of November, 2022, we are going to bring you the women call to worship. Yes, our Thanksgiving offering or worship program to thank God for 14 years of the standpoint and also to celebrate and to thank God for my 25 years in media. I hope you are following us on social media and you're definitely going to be a part of and you're also going to come on as a sponsor, as a supporter, as a donor, whatever you can do to make this possible. If you've ever watched me on TV, if you've ever said you admired me, please Help us make this celebration. 25 years in media, 14 years of the standpoint is success. And you know, if it's worship, you are definitely going to be blessed. Today, I have the right person to start a month. <laughs> a month of overcoming challenges. She has an amazing story. She's been a blessing. I mean, I've known her for years. And I can't stop admiring her, how she does it every time, lifting the bar, low, high. I mean, she keeps going. You don't want to miss this. Let me say thank you to GTP for my fabric, my cloth, and then thank you to Brie Redra for my dress. Makeup by at J. Claude Beauty. You can follow him on Instagram. He's on Facebook as well, and he will glam you up any day, any time. Of course, makeup products, not cosmetics all the time. We take a break when we come back, we meet this lady. She's not a mystery lady. She's somebody I'm sure you have seen before or know of, but I'm not going to tell you who she is. So we'll be back. Welcome back to The Standpoint. And yes, this is a month of overcoming challenges. You know, our general theme for the year 2022 has been broken but beautiful. Seeing your beauty, even in your time of brokenness. And this lady I'm going to talk to today, celebrate her mostly. I mean, it's to celebrate her. She is a living example of seeing beauty in your brokenness and rising above the challenges. Well, let me say thank you to Casa Preco for their Wake Mineral Water and Puma drinks, standing floral um, decor for our beautiful plants, both natural and artificial. House of Food, Antiveria, always, always grateful. Go got to your gut. Um, yep, cleaning services, juice time, and all are supported. We are so, so grateful. You can tell that I'm so much in a hurry to talk to her. Of course, I have access to her. I could have had just a private talk, but you know I'm not selfish, you know. Well, she taught me not to be selfish, you know. My guest today is the one and only Jibodi Kwekundosu. Um, she is uh, the CEO of Jibodi Consulting, and she's a certified high-performance coach. Welcome to the standpoint. Should I say welcome back to the standpoint? Thank you. I was just <laughs> going to say, you know, I was one of the earlier standpointers. Exactly. So you can't, you can't say welcome. But just we welcome back I, home. But I haven't really in celebrated you. Actually. You've always been a part yes, of a discussion or topic. And that's what you love to do. Hi, it's, are you still running a Leo Beauty Spa? <laughs> ah, that's a long story. So it's transitioning. Mm. Now, as you tell, you introduced me as a high performance coach. Coach, yeah. I went into consulting, coaching, and then everything sort of just ran. I was I went to product distribution first. I'm sure you know after yeah. I started the spa, I had four areas. I had the school, I had yeah. the product distribution yeah. academy, then I had the service itself, yeah. then I had the image by Leo, which okay. was sort of helping people to look yeah. good. So okay. I had those now, four. Now, for those who don't know about Alio, yes, yes. Um, exactly. Jibodi <laughs> was one of the first people yes. to open a spa in Ghana. in Ghana. First day spa, actually. First day spa in, in Ghana. Ghana. Yeah. And it was huge. Yeah. You know, every, we all were my GVC days. Yes. When the, and it was a beautiful place. Yes. She ran it for years. She opened branches. Yes, all over. You know, all over, you I, know. I was in. 
Tema, I was in East Lagos. I was everywhere. Um, I was in yes, Ghana. I was yes, all over Ghana. Yes. Uh, and then, ups. but now we know her as a <laughs> totally different. Totally different. So that's what we are talking about. And I want to find out what happened. Oh, when did dear. you go into the coaching? So backstory um, in 2012, because, you know, if uh, my life as an entrepreneur, my life is when I started the business in my father's living room. Mm. The whole Alio concept was in 1998. So I'm 25 years in business next year. Wow. Next year? Yeah. Wow. 2023, yeah. August. I, I always say on the 3rd of August is when I started in my father's living room. Mm as an entrepreneur in Ghana. Right. So I remember very well that during the Alior day, so Alior went through from a living room into a small shop in Seko, in Adabraka, mm. into another small shop in Laboni. Yes, I then, remember that. Junction. Exactly. Then Nyani Bad Junction, even before Nyani Bad Junction, we were inside Labonio. Ooh, they okay. went to Nyani Bad Junction, Junction before the Ultimate, which opened in 2006. Some people were not born, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Some of which were not born. And then in 2016, we were 10 years old. So as you know, I had a big tragedy in 2015 yeah. right. um, when I lost my husband. And if you don't mind, yes. we'll talk about that, yeah. how you dealt with that, because that was a big blow. Sis, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing mm -hmm. how I'm sitting here. Right. And when that happened, so many things were affected. At that time... I was already in transition. I was growing and I was expanding at a fast rate. Yeah. And then tragedy hits. So you had to decide what move to make as a business. And yes, just like everybody else, grief had me paralyzed yeah. for a while. It had me paralyzed for close to two years. That's what people didn't know. People yeah. just saw me come out doing things and they thought, you know, and we'll talk about that, but yeah. I, it, it felt like I was okay. Yeah. But throughout that time, most of the time, I couldn't really move. I couldn't really function. I couldn't really think. So that time I was in the business. Okay. And what I had done is I had sort of built a business, as you mm -hmm. said, around brand Jibodi. So it was around me, even though yeah. it was Alio. Yeah. There was no distinction. No. Alio was Jibodi and Jibodi was, was Alio. So there yeah. were no distinction between who Jibodi is and who Alio is. Mm. So when that happens and the face is not yeah. there. But you tried at a point, yes. you tried to, you know, make that distinction, but it still didn't work. I did everything. It's just like Gifty Auntie and the standpoint. Thank you. And every time <laughs> you go anywhere, they say Madame Alio, Madame yeah, Alio. Yeah. So the Jibodi name was not, you know, that, that known name at that time. So what happened was business was affected, um, management issues. I went through a state of bankruptcy. That's what a lot mm. of people don't even know. Literally failure, where I had to literally close down. And then I opened again. After I closed, business failure complete. And then I started again, started afresh, and then mm. brought it up. And then at that point, everything about what had happened to me right. was working on me. I realized, okay, I'm a business person, I'm an entrepreneur, people come in and do services, but I can do more. I was already doing more, I was already doing but everything I was doing was around looking good, right. helping people feel good. So my trainings and everything was all still focused around beauty. Yeah. But when the tragedy happened, meaning happened to me. Okay. And that was when I said, listen, stop. Meaning happened to you. That's exactly what happened. Tragedy happened. Life stopped and meaning happened. My life literally stopped and meaning happened to me. So when external things, things like style, beauty, they are very important. Mm. But at that time, I was doing it, but not with the meaning mm. of real life behind it. Because now I realize that if I don't express what I can for the living, and I'll tell you this, at the time when during the whole time people would see me, during the funeral, listen, but he's dead. You can't do anything. Stop talking. Like, and when I hear the word dead, it was like, he's not coming back. Yeah. And I remember one time I had a reality conversation with one of my mentors and they told me, he's dead. He can't hear you. Even that was at the funeral. They told me he can't hear you. All the tears, he's gone. And it played. But it didn't make sense then. No. When I was broken, when I was on the floor, when I was all over the place, I remember people saw me and said, hey, but, and they never got it. That that same Alio person who was this beauty, yeah, walking this around, powerful, helping everybody, strong, this powerful, yeah. strong woman, rolling on the floor, going at that time. And that voice hit me. So three, four months after that, it kept hitting me. He's dead. He can't hear you. So I'm like, okay, then what do I do for the living? 
who is left alive? And then that is when I realized, Gifty, when tragedy happens to you, that is when you know, you find all, what I call, you have a lot of fans, mm. but no friends. No friends, exactly. So the day it happened, everybody was around. Days after that, everybody was around. Mm -hmm. Months after that. But I would never forget the day I call the 5th of July, when all was done. Buried, he was in the ground. Everybody had done the refreshments, the activities, funeral activities, everything was gone. And then I remember coming back to my house with my daughter and family members who had flown from all around started leaving. Tomorrow, my flight, this, tomorrow I'm going here. Then the main activities in the house started to die down. Gifty. The house became like a cemetery. No call. No check-in. Nothing. It was just me and this little girl. How old was she? Ten. She was turning 11. It was two weeks to her 11th birthday when the thing happened. It was four weeks from my birthday when it happened. So if when it, it happened to her, she then, it happened four weeks after mine, it happened two weeks to her. So it was all just us looking at each other. And I couldn't, I must tell you, she went through a lot. I must, I tell people all the time, there was a period for about nine months to one year where I don't even know how this girl functioned. I mean, I always say that she's a strong warrior. She used to come into the room and say, get up. Because there are days that I do not get up from the bed. Days. I'm talking about days. days. So there are people who also don't take showers. Yeah. Days in that bed. So it happened to me too. So everybody who's saying, oh, you know, I went through depression. I understand because I stay in that bed. I don't take a shower. I don't drink water. I don't eat. I don't do anything. I'm just there. Mm. And then she'll come. She'll be like, okay, take bread. Then she'll come and stand there and then she's talking. Take this. And then she'll come and stand. And she did that to me a few times. And then one morning she came and she came and said, okay, I'm, not, I'm also not going. I'm also not bathing. I'm also not going to school. I'm also going to sit here. Mm. And at that age, you have a daughter who is coming close to that age. Yeah. And you know them when they are five or a chirpy chirpy. This one was if more chirpy. <laughs> And she said she's not going to school. Today. So she also sat in the bed and this thing. The first day, I didn't mind her because I didn't even know what she was doing. doing. But it was about the second or the third day I realized. If I continue, because I kept saying, you have to go to school. So she was the person that got me to talk, to be able to say something because I was always... And then people close to me and um, my pastor, his wife, it's, they were like the rocks... They were in there, in my room, in my house, at my door. They were just there. They were family. Because at a point, I, I even thought you were going into ministry, full-time ministry. I'm telling you. Because all I had at that time was nobody but God. So they would come in and they would be there with me. Like, literally. And they would hold me down and they would hold. And at that time, I started to focus. That was when, you know, ministry has always been me. And I've always been ministering. So it's yeah. something that had been happening. But real meaning to everything mm -hmm. happened in that few months. So when she came finally, I said to her, okay, I've listened. I'm going to get up. She's like, okay, get up now. So that reason was that she's the living. Yeah. Everybody says he's dead. She's the living. Mm -hmm. How do I live for her? And that is what got me out of it. She was the first reason I realized that, okay, this girl is living. And you know, the dead, it just hits my ear. Even till now, I always people say live with the memories. Yeah. But that is why I got up. And that was when I started realizing, okay, things were very rocky. Things were... So in doing things for her, I started sharing the stories. Let me call it the memories. Mm. Trust me, Nobody has a perfect life. We didn't have the most perfect marriage. Mm. He wasn't a perfect man. I wasn't a perfect woman. Right. But I always say that love lived in my house. Yes. So I can say love lived here. 
with all the imperfections, with all the... So I started sharing the memories. So I started creating stories, reminding myself. So you would see that I started, and I said, how can I write all of this and keep it in a book? Let me take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about that because I would also want to find out why you kept, you, you, I mean, what kept you crippled? Was it, was it a, a sense of feeling guilty that you, you have your life, you know, you, you continue living your life when he's not around? I mean, you know, people talk, talk about the grieving moment and the things that makes, made it impossible for them to kind of rise above it. But we'll, we'll find out uh, that when we come back. Let me say thank you once again to GTP for my cloth. My dress is by Brie Redua. Makeup by at J Cloth Beauty on Instagram. And the makeup products always by Note Cosmetics. We'll be back. Years ago, I used to mention Alio. <laughs> yes, very much so. We'll be back. <laughs> Welcome back to The Standpoint. And as always, I say thank you to Mrs. Oferipoko and the family for always supporting us during our recordings. But Jigbodi, what really kept you crippled? Definitely was not guilt. Mm. What kept me crippled was knowing, beginning to understand that those conversations will not happen anymore. Mm -hmm. the, and I think that I always say that as an entrepreneur, and you know it as a woman in business. Mm. When you have somebody that when all the world is down, mm. things are down, you can just say a, thing, a few things to and they can sound you out, correct you, um, help with certain things. Yeah. That was the and first thing. And sometimes even support you financially. Every, like in every way, he just yeah. was that person who was the reason, like the reasoning ability that I had. So now that function of me, it's like a part, that function didn't function. Mm -hmm. I remember having a day when even things in my house went wrong. The tap was off. He used to just walk down and go and do it. Just basic things. Yeah. I couldn't do it. I stood there and I started crying because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where things were. And I realized how that, so what kept me crippled was that I functioning, functioning abilities were completely dependent on, on him. him. And these were real functioning, my day-to-day -day functioning were dependent. He was that kind of person who was very present mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. So he was so present that his absence caused you to cease functioning. Right. You know, and people see me and see everything outside. So I had to recreate that function. Mm -hmm. And that's why people talk about strength. I always say it's recreating yourself and building those functions independently. And that's tough. Give recreating to you. yourself is I tough. I had to build each and every function of myself and do it in such a way that I would never have to have it so vested in someone and not be able to pull it. So even though I depended on people, I depended, I had some very good friends that came out of the way you know, people who were my rocks and so on. But I always said to myself, if I'm going to get out of this hole completely, it's never to. going to be them. It has to be me. And that little girl would always say, you know, you're not looking good. She'll come in straight. You are not, to say things that will make you like really wake up. Yeah. So that is when I and started. And coming from your own daughter, it hits home. And you it, know she's being She's being real. real. She's being yeah. real. I mean, she, there was nothing she said that she covered up. And I mean, and I realized that she needed, you know, I forgot that she needed somebody too. You know, I forgot that she needed to talk to somebody too. So I was being selfish. Yeah. I was grieving alone and not grieving with her. So when we decided to start grieving together, telling the stories, leaving the memories, then I realized I could share this to help somebody. So that was when meaning happened to me. And that was when I said, listen, Alio is great. Alio has gone through a process. Alio is, people are struggling to deal with Alio right now, mm -hmm. but you know what? I need to give people meaning. So it was a transition, mm. trying to be that businesswoman with that face of Alio right. to that human being with meaning yeah. that can tell somebody 
that listen, if you do this and you do this and you do this, yeah. if you are not functioning, you need this to function. If you are not communicating. So I started to look at all the things that happened. And then I took myself on another educational journey. Yeah. But you know, Jibodi, even with Alio, I feel you were still giving meaning. Teaching women to take good care of themselves. You talk, you you did programs on grooming, even the basic etiquette. I, mean, I remember you taught at then GBC yes. Breakfast Show how to where to place the fork and the, the you know the spoon and the plates and all that, how to hold it. You were giving meaning, but you, you didn't think that was deep enough. The depth of that mm. I felt help people to be to live better lifestyles. Mm. This stage that I went into helped people to live better lives. So there was a difference between a lifestyle Style and, and a life. life. And that was what I did differently. So this is where my dichotomy became. So mm -hmm. Alio gave people a lifestyle, wellness, etiquette, branding, everything extent, everything that would help people, like basically connect to you. And then this part of Jibodi, I had to study human behavior. I had mm. to study what, I had to understand what I went through. The breakdown, the crippling. The, I had to understand the kind of things to do to communicate, the kind of ways to, and help people who are struggling within. That is why even today when I teach people to, to communicate, I know that it is not some, a function of what is going on externally, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a function of what is going on internally. Mm. So I had to work to meaning. I understand what you're saying, but that tragedy, that tragedy was everything. Mm. A turning point, a major turning point. Sis, when I sit and I talk and I smile, I remember there was this gentleman that came, one of the people who were greeting um, during the whole thing. And I would never forget his face when he saw me. I think, you know, the, the way I looked and the way like probably I had been looking okay. outside and he... He had this horror. You know, I know people were, it was difficult for people to tell me yeah. how bad I, I went, like how badly I went down. Mm -hmm. And this guy had this horror, like, is this your body? Like, no, it can't be. Do you understand? And mm -hmm. some of those things reminded me of how terrible it was. And when it's like that, that's why I leave people to break down. I leave people to go through that. Because you see, a lot of times when grief happens, a lot mm. of times when these things happen, a lot of people just say, shedding. Mm. Ebe ye. Ebe, yeah. So, so don't don't hold yourself. Like, yeah. Do not hold it. Be yeah. strong. I would never. Mm. You need says, to go through it. I would never tell anybody who is grieving to do that. I'll tell you, cry all you want to. The only thing you have to try to do at the end of it is to find the functions that are not working and build them up again. Everybody loses a particular function. I, some people lose more than many. And people put widows in the states that every widow is probably in one category. Mm. And it has been generalized. Right. So maybe I'm a widow, I, can, I did not have anything, and my husband takes care of me. Mm. I'm a widow, I'm working, but my husband supports it. And there's nothing wrong with whatever category mm. you are, you will still break. Mm. Even the people who are the top, whether they talk about wealth, value, fame, everything, you will break. So I never, you will break. And it's okay to break. It is actually normal. It is actually abnormal Not when they tell you be strong and so on. Because the person who is telling you may have an understanding, but they will never know. That's what I say. It's a very big difference. You know, I can appreciate where you're coming. But I would never know your pain. pain. The stress. Yeah. Then the joy that comes, comes eventually. In. Then that person who was looking to enjoy just drops. So think about it. So every single process was breaking. And I, I hear broken but beautiful. I just mm. laugh because really pieces. Yeah. Mine is torn. Like yeah. Yeah. pieces. It's, it's like I, I, I used to feel like paper weightless, mm -hmm. nothing. And it was, ah, but you, you that was talking to everybody, you that helps mm -hmm. everybody. Yes, mm -hmm. I felt like nothing, yeah. completely. And I didn't. people like us, is, is when it hits, it really hits hard. And we break and up. Because you have no back, nobody, everybody's depending on you. You have no one to fall 
Exactly so right. yeah. I always say that, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, how do you look at relationships and all this? Because, you know, even the people around you, and I know you go through this. When you are in a relationship with somebody, be it a friendship, be it a love relationship like your husband, they look at you as so strong that you can handle a lot of things on your own. That when you are breaking, they actually just leave you there because <laughs> they think you can come back. You can come back. And it's everything. Yes. My husband used to even be guilty of it too, as well. Yeah. He Sometimes he's like, oh, you can't do it. Yeah. So when oh, they break, it should be fine. Oh, she'll be fine. 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 And that is one of the things. They think it's okay. So you can imagine everybody else around you. So that was when that breaking point became very lonely. So even though people were pulling me up, helping me up, pushing me up, I still broke. I broke in every phase. I broke financially. I broke physically. I broke health. I broke mentally. I broke emotionally. I broke everywhere. And I was like paper, light. So the only thing I had was putting my experience down, sharing it with other people, and then helping other people to understand that this experience is real. And this experience will happen to somebody at some point in their life. And that was when this whole meaning, when I said, listen, help people to live. What skills do they need to live, live? And I had to do it myself before I could teach others. Yes. And that is where the whole new branch of body came, helping people. And when I talk about people performance, high performance, it's not about what people see like top performing in merit, but being a human being. Being that person who has empathy, emotion, encouragement, when you are engaging somebody. So being a human being is very different from this, having human skills is very different from being a lifestyle coach. Yeah. So that is the breaking point. That's when Jibo, the real Jibodi. So even though I have all facets of still my beauty, my, I want to still believe that I need a life to live a life, lifestyle. In this, I, I mean, I, it's going to stay with me. <laughs> That's the difference between having a lifestyle and having a life. Very good. And I learned it reality. So gift it. I had to start from scratch just to be able to tell the story, just to be able to help other people. I started my business from scratch, like nothing ever existed because I had to leave the old and then say, okay, I'll come back to Alio. Maybe one day. For now, let me be Jibodi. Let Jibodi be that person who helps others to live so they can have a lifestyle. How were you accepted when you, <laughs> you, you moved from? It's difficult because a lot of people know you in a certain category. My big fortune was that whilst I was working at Ali, a lot of my work was done in corporate. Yeah. So I did a lot, you know, with, mm. you know, companies, with TV mm -hmm. stations. Mm -hmm. with, so I worked a lot around corporate. That was the biggest benefit I had because, you know, bringing human behavior and human skills into corporate, they must know you, but everybody had a tag. So many times when I come there, I hear, ah, so this beautician too, what's she doing here? <laughs> ah, but she's a beautician. She said, yeah. So I always tell my beautician ladies because I have such a huge following. You know, yes. Thousands of people have opened their salons today. Because of you. Yes. Because I started. Yes. I had the courage to start. Yes. I had the ability to train yes. other people. And so many of my girls are out there. And I see it. I'm so proud. And they are all still in the circle. Right. They call me. I have my girls and my boys. I have those who have opened schools, those who have done well, those who are still in the system, those who are... And they all... When I started this, everybody says, because of you, I could do it. Yeah. Because of you, I could do it. So... For me, that meaning still matters. Yes. You know, I gave a lifestyle, but I gave people the meaning, meaning. of it. And, and I always say that, listen, the fact that you are in the vocations doesn't mean that you, ha you don't have an education. Listen, mm -hmm. whether you're a hairdresser, you have an education. education. Once, listen, there's three. There's qualification by experience. Oh. Qualification by expertise. You can learn by, qualification by, by schooling. So all of that... It's education. Yeah. So I just hated the fact that the beauty industry, mm. those vocational industry, it's mechanics are looked down, down upon. I can't stand it. Because, you know, sis, look globally. 
Yeah. They are the most important Potentially, people. Yeah, of course. They make more money, money than, than white collar. <laughs> Look at a mechanic shop outside. Yeah. Look at how yeah. people even pay. You go yeah. out a lot. If yeah. you go to a spa outside, can you imagine how much it costs? Those industries are what drive lifestyles. And I tell them they're the biggest resource. So when people look down on them, I used to fight. That, for me, was meaning. Yeah. I was fighting, fighting, advocating, and I wanted to bring a standard to that industry. And I did it. For that, I'm grateful. Yeah. I had to move to now take each individual human being and help them to and I must say that you've done well with Brand Djibouti. Transitioning, oh it's been beautiful. It's been amazing. I see the classes you organize all the time. It's always fully booked. I'm telling you. You know, sold and out. It's sold out, you know. And I know you have one coming up. Yes. We're going to take my final <laughs> yes. break when we come back. And I'll get a bit into your growing up. Oh, yes. <laughs> you are watching the oh stand my God, going and we are story. celebrating <laughs> Jigbodi. Yes, now Jigbodi. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, yeah. ha, I thought I knew a lot, but today I'm finding out a lot more about her. You know, yes, she is the real deal when it comes to rising above challenges. Well, let me say thank you to uh, Puma Drinks and Awake Purified Mineral Water by Casa Preco Company Limited. Standing floral and deco for our plants, both natural and artificial. I mean, I just love them. I'm so grateful to them. House of Food, Auntie Vera and the team. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to Yuck Cleaning Services. Everything cleaning before, after, during your event, your home, wherever it is. Um, fumigating, what I mean, everything cleaning. You call them and they'll be there to support you. Go God, you got for every woman you got is very important. And if it has to be, you got it has to be. Go God, you got. And of course, juice time. We'll be back. Welcome back to the standpoint. Where did you grow up, Jibut? <laughs> I grew up in Ghana. I call it the Osu Residential Extension. People didn't know. Osu <laughs> RE. It's actually yes. Osu Residential Extension. Extension. Oh, okay. When that's we, Osu RE. That's it. And a lot of people say, oh, Osu, Osu RE Residential. And, you know, in that area, at that time, we didn't have this whole Oxford Street thing. Mm -hmm. It was one of the quietest neighborhoods ever. Before Oxford Street actually popped up. Well. So if you could walk from your house to Dankwa Circle and you wouldn't see a thing. At that time, I was just right there. So that's when I grew up. And my grandmother lived in Latibi Okoshi. So she lived between Circle and Abaka and Latibi So I had three different homes okay. that I shuttled between. Okay. Um, so my, I grew up amongst eight boys. I'm the ninth and I'm the girl, only girl. The only girl. And I was the baby. So Ooh. you can imagine what I've been through. Beaten. <laughs> Dumped, yeah. <laughs> jump over walls, yeah. used for every excuse, excuse. ever. Uh -huh. um, I know, because I'm also the last one, so, ah, so you I'm know. the last of eight. Ah, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that means you and I are this thing. <laughs> I, so I, after the mm -hmm. all, you know. But I was daddy spy. Uh, were you, you also were a spy? Oh, yes. <laughs> but you see, my own was challenging because I had to be the spy. And I was the same person that they sent to go and ask for things. for things. So I had to be on both sides because if I wasn't, I'll get beaten. So when I came, you know, it was more like unexpected. Right. You know, and I came and I became... Same like me. They used to call me accidental baby. Me too. <laughs> so I think that's our commonality oh, right there. <laughs> you know, so accidental. So I came and then all of a sudden everybody says, oh, a girl, because everybody was expecting another boy. Boy. Of course, and then a girl came, and then I had to. So I did things as a tomboy for a while, as for that. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Richard School, and then from Richard School, I went to Accra Girls, okay. and then from Accra Girls, I traveled to the US, mm -hmm. and I went to university. I did my postgraduate and everything before I came to Ghana. So throughout all those years, when I was growing up as a child mm -hmm. here in Ghana, there was a lot of like, struggle. Right. Self-esteem, rejection, identity. Let me, mm. I, let me just call my heart serious identity issues. Mm. Serious identity. And I could not tell which direction. And, you know, I always say that. But you grew up with your parents. I did. Okay. I grew up with my dad and my grandma. But, but my grandma, 
sort of, as soon as I was like 11, 12, she sort of moved because my mom was in and out. She was okay. traveling and stuff like that. And at some point she was unwell. So during that period, it was my grandmother mm. that, that grounded me. Mm. And she okay. just helped. And my grandmother, I, that's why I, I do those things. It, it fascinates me when people mm -hmm. say people are this thing. My grandmother was like literally semi-literate. Mm. She was three years old when she was sent off as a maid. She had to learn English. Where she was, I mean, if she speaks English, you think she's, she understands, but she had to learn English there. She had to go. So she, I even call her semi-literate, but she was literally stark illiterate. Mm -hmm. But she grew up to be the strongest pillar mm. of the family. She was, um, she was able to do entrepreneurship, built homes. She was into real estate, cloth, and Piccadilly. Whoa. So Piccadilly yeah. biscuits. I, I call myself the pioneer child in Piccadilly. <laughs> Because that was how I grew up. She used to take me to fire service. I don't know whether I remember fire service. Fire service of Gornel. That yeah. is where Piccadilly was. I was only 10 years old. Going on to 11. So by the time I was 12, I was already selling Piccadilly in like, you know those trays? It's like a metal tray. Yeah. And she would pile, pile it up. Them. We would leave home at 3.30 to be at Piccadilly at 4 to be able to take our goods. She was a distributor. So to mark her attendance, to show that this is the time she got there for her to be in line. I don't know whether you people even remember these kind of things. You have to show her a distribution book and she has to do it. And we'll go and sit there 3.30 a.m. until her name is called. And then they'll pack these things. And then we will have to come and carry them. At that time too, you had only the bone shakers. Yeah. You carry them and then you bring them home. So people see me today like, oh, you had Dada B. B. I'm, I'm saying you. this because some of my people, they think I'm completely that happy. <laughs> and then you carry this tray and then you go. And you know what she will do? She will load the tray. She won't tell me how, whatever. She just says, come back with an empty tray and the exact money you've taken. She says, I had to get out of the house. This time it was at, at the Baccaron Circle. And you know, that was when I learned my first marketing skill. Cry for sympathy. <laughs> So I go to people, I said, you know, tomorrow I have to go to school. I have to do my homework. My grandmother said, this, please, will you buy two? She said, oh, can you wear a mobile? Then they give me. And I go to the next shop. <laughs> Same thing. Next house. That is how I sold. And I'll come back. And sometimes when I come, if I have one, I'll be lashed. So, and if I don't have the exact money, I'll be lashed. Yes. And at that time, I used to think, does this woman like me? My grandmother loves me to bits. She was just helping me to have their foundations. Because mm -hmm. I was a girl among boys. I was, I needed to be. So in addition to my education, listen, I went to Richard School, and sometimes when I'm going to school, they used to call me, they used to, you know, I, I used to, my friends used to call my thing Masca tea because my mascatella, yeah. uh, masca water, the, uh, she would put half, she would put the rest water. So I used to do mascatella, one bottle of mascatella three times a week. week. <laughs> she had a, this bottle, and then she would put three mascatella, and the rest is water. So that was my drink. So while people used to have cook and, and biscuit, me, I'll have biscuit because Piccadilly biscuit, biscuit. and mascara water. <laughs> so I had a whole story growing up, but she was able to help me to go on. And, you know, I used to think, wow. But as I grew up, she started to mold me. So when I look at some of the things I do today, mm -hmm. some of the detail I have, and, you know, I always say that, you know, even though I went to school and got certified for protocols and etiquette, you see, my grandmother, the first person that taught me etiquette. You know how it is. Mm -hmm. They even etiquette, how to put a plate down, no. I learned from her. Because she lived with these white people at three years old. And so she was watching. She, she showed. So that's what piqued my interest in lifestyle. It's just the way she lived. And I never knew I was picking. That's why they tell people, when you have a child, they don't follow your instruction. They follow mm. your example. So true. Everybody that raised me around my dad, same thing. So when I come to my dad's house, my dad had a bakery, he had a distillery. So he was also an entrepreneur, he was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So the Dada B side a bit came from there. Okay. But even there I had to work. But my grandmother, mm -hmm. she taught you everything. Yes, you People say, oh, I'm a great cook because I love putting things mm -hmm. together. My cooking came from there. If you are sick, I don't know whether this thing, they'll say put medicine yeah. in a, a bank or whatever. And then, then you swallow. She yeah. say, Give the girl water. In this, I've, I hate medicine to today because of that. Because whenever I put medicine, I'm crying. Mm -hmm. Chloroquine. Do you remember yeah. when you have oh, malaria? Oh, just like my dad. They'll put it on a spoon, add water, and you will drink it. Uh -huh. I even feel it now. Uh -huh. Sitting yes. here. Mm 
mm -hmm. they crush it. They crush it, yeah. And then you have to drink it. Yes. Chloroquine. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes six mm -hmm. pieces or so, something. Mm -hmm. We went They will never, my, my dad too, will never put it in that bag, go and hide it and swallow it. And say, no, you have to she see says, what you're taking. It. And people yeah. are saying, oh, she says, no, she has to learn the bitterness of life yeah. and the sweetness of life. And I never got it that I was face. You know, so those things were all, she said, she has to know what is bitter. She has to know what is hard. She has to know what is sweet. She has to know love. She has to know hate. She has to know respect. Rejection. She had to know disgrace. She has to know embarrassment. She used to say these things that I need to know what all these things were. Now, why do I suspect that after the tragedy, all these things came back to you? Everything. It was never before. When I was living a lifestyle, I used to talk about it. I used to go see her. To, but when the tragedy hits, it all makes sense. Certainly. Everything. The bitterness of life. The embarrassment of life, the disgrace of life, the loss, the fear, everything, all my life flashed in my eyes. And I said, if I'm going to live, the only way I'm going to live is to help other people live. Sis, it's not been an easy journey. Yeah. That childhood experience was something that I lost along the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was living life. I was yeah. saying, listen, I have, you know, the, 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 what it takes. I was yeah. doing business. Yes, I was yeah. on the run. run. Yeah. I was giving mm -hmm. everything. I was yeah. giving myself. I was this, you know, very known businesswoman. I was everywhere. Across the continent. Everywhere. I remember. You remember? Yeah. I yeah. was in every everywhere. country. Yeah. I was traveling. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. And this was you were me. international networks. I'm and telling you. I remember. When the ice bar, they came yes. to Ghana. Yes. yes. And then, I mean, everything. Mm -hmm. It was just big, 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 big. big. And yeah. that was all I saw. Now, when you see big, you see real life. The real life. The real situation. When you see the real Jibouti, it is that person who has lived the lifestyle and has seen the life, and is saying, get the life first before you live the lifestyle. lifestyle. That is my mantra now. Yeah. First live. Yeah. First have life. life. Everything else, the lifestyle, live it, but have life first. Yeah. Because if you start with the lifestyle, that journey is a circular yes, journey. You will come and back to it. Trust me, sis, if you don't, if you're not careful, and during that journey, you don't have the energy, the ability, and you drop in the valley, hmm. you will never come back to the life. But when you live the life, you'll be able to come to the lifestyle. That is what I realized. A lot of people like me fell in the valley. And listen, what took me to come out of the valley, if it wasn't for certain things like this little thing, some people drop in the valley. I and know they people never, never return. They've lived the lifestyle. Something has gone wrong in their business. Something has gone wrong in their life and they drop. Haven't you seen many people like oh. that? The ones All we grew up with, yes. Yes. the ones we know. Yes. Something just cuts off, something pulls. Yeah. And when tragedy happens and they go, they never come back. They never come out. And that is why I want the, this generation, you know we are from the, our, our fifth floor generation. Floor, yeah, exactly. But that generation, that is coming. Yeah. Have to and learn. even our generation. Oh, says, yes. Because there's some True. in our generation who True. still, I'm um, sorry to they say, don't get don't it. Get it. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. They don't get it. And I get it that if you don't go through this, you know, because that's why I say things like, you know, honoring, you know, mm -hmm. celebrating each other. Yeah. I mean, the last time I met you and I was just yeah. excited, I said, yeah. listen, and I was so proud that I had, yes. I, I had to give you that award. I know. And I said, <laughs> listen, my sis has broken boundaries, has mm. done, the, and mm. I know what you've, and you continue mm. to do great things. And I celebrate you more. Yeah, you are celebrating celebrate me, you. but I'm celebrating. And I celebrate and, you. And I, I remember that on my social media page, I made sure that people knew who you were. Yeah. Because it's important yeah. that honor is yeah. given. And people think that the fact that we are sisters, the fact that we respect each other, each the fact other. that we know each other, doesn't mean I can't celebrate you. you. That doesn't thing. mean that I can't have a certain relationship where I honor you. Yeah. And all of this is usually left in the gutter. Okay. It's left in the valley. It's left there. Because we are thinking about this versus that. Right. Life, people look at this year. 
I just mm -hmm. watch a lot of people, mm -hmm. painful people, mm -hmm. just yeah. going, yeah. painful yeah. stories. Yeah. And people yeah. are just going. Yeah. And I'm asking, are you living? living. And what are you leaving? Mm -hmm. So I have two L's, living, living and, and leaving. And that is what drives me now. Helping people to live so they can live well enough. Seth, to say that I'm proud of you is an understatement. And uh, we don't talk often. We don't, yes. we don't meet often. We don't, you know, do things. To the, but I am always following you on social media, on your programs. And I, I get amazed. I've admired you for years for my GBC days and everything. I've had opportunity where I've confided in you in the past and everything. But today, we just want to celebrate you. you and I'm just happy for who you have become and becoming because this is this not your is limit. Just, oh, yeah, this just is the, the beginning. The beginning. Great thing. I was telling things. the team this morning. Momentum has started. This, this is just the beginning. the beginning, you know. And I mean, the, especially the lives you're touching. And as we said earlier on, you know, your programs are mostly sold out. And you see the joy on the faces of especially the young ones who attend these. And I will urge anyone, follow Jibodi, uh, Jibodi the Instagram pages. Um, Jibodi Kwaku. On all social media, social media networks. Jibodi networks. Kwaku. Yeah. When, when is your next program? My next coming? program is 1st October. 1st October. And I'm awesome. helping people with communication, human skills, mm. and using that to communicate relationships, like okay. how they need to know who they are. There are so many people who are having things going on inside. They need to just send messages mm. across. They need to get jobs. They need to do, but they are so scared. Right. They feel they don't have it. They feel... I cannot even speak. I cannot even share. Look at how we are yes. having yes. conversations here. Exactly. People cannot yes. have these kind of conversations. Right. Meanwhile, they are struggling in either a relationship, they are struggling to get a job, they are struggling to win a business. And I want to help people become better right. in that area. Yeah. So that next program is a class with Jibodi. It's coming on the 1st right. of October. And how can people 22. get on register? It's, it's everywhere on social media at yeah. the moment. Okay. So they can just call 244 Three three seven three four zero. Okay. Um, they can go to WhatsApp. Same thing. Zero five zero five eight six five one three two. They can go to every place. All the links are everywhere. And I even have a bigger one coming in November for those who are already speakers and want to become dominant. Okay. That one is also coming. So November, yeah. October. Watch this space. Now your final words to people watching you who are going through challenges and are struggling to rise above it. Challenges are there for you to be able to rise above it. That's the whole idea. But the issue is that you, when you are down there, go through it, be in the pit, cry, break. But the only thing I always say is remember who you are going to rise up for. Mm. You need to raise something called necessity. In coaching, we call it raising necessity. There's always a reason that brings you out. That reason, people call it your why, they call it, but you need to have a reason. Is it your mother? Is it the fact that you haven't finished what you're doing? I knew people on their deathbed mm -hmm. that rose up because they had that yes. necessity. You need to raise that necessity no matter what. And that is what got me out. In spite of pain, in spite of rejection, in spite of disgrace, in spite of embarrassment, in spite of everything that holds you down, the choice you make is, am I raising necessity for what? It is not, you can't do it alone. And you can't do it by yourself. The thing that says, oh, everybody that says, rise up, rise up, says it's important. But who right. are you doing it for? What are you doing it for? And why right. are, you, are doing you doing it? it? Once you ask yourself those questions and there's a reason, use that reason to come out. It's not easy. But you have a reason and use that reason to rise up. And I say amen to that. Amen, sis. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And Thank you. that's why we need to do part two. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. The stories, <laughs> the they are different parts. We, we have series. We, we've spoken about some today. The, 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 yes. But you know, our, the, our, our story book. park is this. The, the, the books. Uh, when, are, when are the books coming out? <laughs> it's all written. Mm -hmm. It's all written. Mm -hmm. so. But soon. soon.
than later. Okay. It will be popping up. As for Amen. that, this, this story needs to be heard. It has to be. So one of these days is coming out. And I'm <laughs> proud of you for your books. Oh. And as they come out. <laughs> thank yes. you too. Thank you thank so you much. Too. Thank you for having me. Thank and you thank you. Having. And I honor you. I honor you too. So much. Much love. Thank you. Right. So this is the first of our series yeah. on writing about challenges this month of September. Next week, we'll bring you another lady who rose from grass to grace and then went back to grass and now back to grace. Back to Love grace. It. I'll be back with a bit of me. <laughs>is not perfect. I know it's become like a cliche, but life is really not perfect. I mean, take a closer look at your life. Where you are coming from, where you are, it hasn't been perfect. If you really want to be true to yourself, it hasn't been. But I'm sure there's been things you've been through when you felt like it was all over. You didn't even know where you were going to be the next moment, but somehow you are here. We all have stories of challenges. We all have stories of brokenness. We all have stories of pain, irrespective of where you grew up from, whether from a rich home, a poor home, middle class, irrespective of your race, your tribe, whatever it is. We all have such stories. But for some of us, it's still with us. We have on a facade as if everything is okay. But deep down, it's not okay. When you read my book, A Bit of Me, there's one whole write-up on it's okay not to be okay. There must come a time when you have to sit down Analyze who you are. Accept your brokenness, your pains, your scars. And find out how you are going to deal with them. How you can overcome it. And to tell you the truth, it's good to see psychologists. It's good to see counselors. It's good to see your pastor, whoever it is. It's good to have good friends to talk to. But all these people, the only thing they can do is to help you to get to a place of acceptance, of realization, of deciding to do something about it. So ultimately, the decision is all yours. It will all come back to you, what you want to do, and what you want to do with what you have, what you are left with. What is it? Is it financial loss? Loss of a loved one? Is it disgrace, shame, whatever it is? You can rise above it. Anything, everything thrown at you, you can rise above it. It all depends on you. And I hope that this day you make a decision to rise above the challenges. It's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. But you can. You can. And I trust you that you can by the grace of God. I'm a woman with super crazy faith in God. I know God has got me covered. No matter how low I go, I know God has got me covered. But I know he's given me wisdom. And that wisdom is to ensure that I never give up on myself. Thanks for watching. See you same time next week. And remember, you can rise about this challenge too. Mwah.